All right. So uh, thanks so much, uh, Emily, for being with us this evening to share your knowledge about prairie dogs. Uh, for folks who don't know Emily, she is the executive director for the Grand Canyon Wolf Recovery Program. But long before she started helping wolves, she was um, helping prairie dogs and studying them and learning about them. But the thing that I really like about Emily is she uses her knowledge and has used her knowledge um, to help wildlife. And um, so in addition to being willing to share information with us, uh, she's out there, out there on the ground um, helping out all kinds of critters, including prairie dogs. So uh, without further ado, Emily, welcome and uh, take it away. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone. I know some of you, um, so probably I'm guessing this won't be very new information um, for many of you. Let's see if I get this. Can you see my screen, the PowerPoint now? Okay. Great. Um, so I'm also on the board of directors for a nonprofit group called Habitat Harmony, uh, which is based in Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, I use the she, her pronouns and live in the traditional homelands of Navajo, Hopi, uh, Havasupai, Wallapai, um, and many um, tribes that consider this area sacred. Uh, so I started as a volunteer uh, back in 2003 with uh, Habitat Harmony when I was a college student. Um, and I started volunteering on um, a translocation project that was behind the Flagstaff Mall. Um, so that got me started. And then since then I got involved with the board um, and I was really interested in finding out more about um, how well the prairie dogs actually survived the translocation process that we did um, that year when I was a volunteer. And so I became more interested in that as a research topic and trying to improve the translocation um, efforts to increase survival for prairie dogs. Um, so my main um, expertise is really with the Gunnison's prairie dog, uh, which is the species we have here in Northern Arizona but I'll just talk a little bit about um, all five species of prairie dogs that we have in North America. Um, so all prairie dogs are social burrowing brown squirrels. Um, and the Gunnison's prairie dog, oops, let's see. I don't know if I can find a pointer. There we go. Okay, can you see that pointer? Yeah, okay, so there's the Gunnison's prairie dog range. Um, and there's, it's considered of the white tail grouping of the five species of prairie dogs. So they have white tails, there's a white tail prairie dog species, and then the Utah prairie dog, um, which is a threatened, listed as a threatened species. The black tail prairie dog is the most widespread of the five species, um, and it has a black tail. And then the Mexican prairie dog in Mexico is listed as an endangered species in Mexico, and it's also of the black tail group. Um, the white tail prairie dogs, you can kind of see that here um, for these Gunnison's prairie dogs, um, have that kind of gray to white tip of their tail. They, all three of the white tail species, hibernate in the winter. So, probably going into hibernation about now uh, for the winter months, and they'll start to emerge in February and March, depending on the, the conditions and how much body fat they have been able to store over the winter. Um, and the Gunnison's prairie dog is considered the most ancient of all five species of prairie dogs. Um, here, just for reference, because um, I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about the black tail prairie dog, um, even though that is also a species that was found historically in Arizona, and then eradicated by the 1960s, completely from Arizona. 
and then it has been reintroduced um, into um, southern Arizona and Las Cienegas conservation area. Um, just for reference, um, it's believed that there were, was an estimate of 6.6 .6 million acres of Gunnison's prairie dog in Arizona. Um, and then there was also 650,000 to over 1 million acres of blacktail prairie dog at one time in Arizona. Um, this was the last estimate. It might have, uh, there might be a, a little bit more current estimate, but there's about 135 blacktail prairie dogs on 19 acres in Southeast Arizona as of 2017. So all species of prairie dogs are considered a keystone species. Um, you're probably familiar with this, but um, one study found that there's at least 109 different species that are all associated with prairie dogs in some way. So this means that they have a disproportionate effect on the um, grassland communities in which they inhabit relative to their abundance. They play this really important role as a keystone species. Um, and this is by providing their prey species, so their food for lots of different predators, um, including coyotes, hawks, um, eagles, um, snakes, badgers, um, and the black-footed ferret, of course, is an obligate predator species on prairie dogs. Um, they're also really important to the grassland in that they are grazers themselves. So they kind of nibble on the vegetation when they feed above ground around their colonies. And that, that helps stimulate new growth of vegetation. And so that new growth is um, typically more tender and nutritious for herbivores that will feed on the grassland vegetation such as bison, um, pronghorn, um, other species like that actually will prefer to come and feed on the grassland vegetation on prairie dog colonies um, more often than off the colonies. Um, the prairie dogs also provide habitat for a lot of different species that will also use their burial system. Um, such as you can see, here's black-footed ferret, snakes, rabbits, um, lots of different insects, um, as well as burrowing owls that won't dig their own burrows, but they will use the burrows of prairie dogs. So that's an important role they provide, um, as well as just helping to turn over the soil and also help rainwater percolate. Um, so there's been studies that have shown um, the water table can actually increase under prairie dog colonies as opposed to off colonies. Um, so they provide that really important feature as well. Here's just a closer look at some of the um, burrow systems, what they might look like underground. So they can be, you know, complex systems that include um, bedrooms and nursery chambers underground, um, as well as they usually have, let's see if they show it, here's like a latrine area that they'll have um, specific rooms for. So you'll often see above ground, you might see what's considered more of like a volcano mound that um, slopes up and then there, there'll be at least one or more exit burrows as well. Um, and those will help bring the air, will circulate down through those exit burrows that are flat on the surface. And then the air will flow, help flow out the volcano mounds. And um, so they are these complex um, systems of burrows underground that are usually at least um, in a Flagstaff area, they're at least 36 inches deep because they have to have those bedrooms below the frost line for hibernation. Um, so that can vary somewhat with elevation and the frost line in different places. But, and, and oftentimes their tunnels will have, they might have down slopes as well as up slopes and that will help them move into higher um, areas in the burrows to kind of sit out floods if there's really heavy rains as well. 
probably most of you know this about prairie dogs, but they do have one of the most sophisticated animal languages that's actually ever been identified um, in science. And most of that research has been done uh, right here in Flagstaff uh, with Professor Khan Slavashkov, um, who studied Gunnison's prairie dogs for many years, looking at their barks. Um, and within each bark that a prairie dog will communicate, he found that they actually are communicating in a complete sentence um, so that they might have a different call for a coyote versus a dog versus a human. And then within that single bark, they're also communicating like how fast it's moving, um, what it might be wearing, if it's a human, if it's carrying something, that kind of thing. So they have this really complex language that they've evolved um, by living in these colonies in social units. So some of the major threats that prairie dogs um, and in particular, the Gunnison's prairie dog um, has faced over really the last century um, has included government poisoning campaigns. Um, we know that that was a, a very specific and well-funded effort through the early 1900s up until about the 1960s that really wiped out um, prairie dog populations all over the United States. Um, so that's what eradicated all the black tail prairie dogs in southern Arizona. Um, and then just from poisoning efforts alone, um, they declined at least 92% across the range for the Gunnison's prairie dog. And then that, you know, in combination with some other threats, um, including shooting, um, that is somewhat regulated in Arizona, but not very well regulated um, and also plague. Um, but in terms of shooting and hunting regulations in Arizona, we do have a closed season from April 1st until June 30th. And that is to protect um, the females that may be nursing pups underground. So when they prairie dogs wake up um, in the spring from hibernation, the females are actually only receptive to mating on one single day of the entire year. Um, so females are only receptive usually for a few hours. It's not all on the exact same day um, because the females might wake up at different times, but um, they don't breed like rabbits. Um, so they only mate one day of the year and then they um, only have one litter of pups. It's usually three to five pups that will be born um, in the spring underground in their burrow. So the adult females will come above ground and will be feeding on the vegetation um, through the spring um, and early summer, and then going down into the burrow to nurse their dependent pups. Um, and then the pups don't start emerging until July above ground. And at that point, they'll start eating vegetation on their own. So we did um, successfully extend the closed season a couple years ago from June 15th to June 30th. So it was a small step um, to continue protecting the dependent pups underground, but um, obviously it's not much <laughs> of an effort. So um, the prairie dogs do hibernate um, usually from October to about February or March. Um, so there's limited shooting in those times, but there's still a couple months in the spring and then and through the rest of the summer and fall that shooting is allowed and there's no bag limit on venison's prairie dogs. So plague um, is also a major threat to prairie dogs all across the West. Um, and I'll talk actually a little bit more about this. I have a se separate slide, um, but this is something that um, is also an ongoing threat um, to the conservation um, as well as with urbanization and development. Um, that's often, we like to, you know, build things, unfortunately, on prairies um, and prairie dog colonies tend to be flat properties that are prone to development. So this is a really busy slide. Um, you don't have to read all of this, but just to give you a little bit of background, um, the Gunnison's prairie dog was petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act 
in 2004. And that prompted a series of responses to try and get an assessment of their conservation. So the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies wrote the Gunnison's Prairie Dog Conservation Assessment 2006. And then that led to the Whitetail Prairie Dog and Gunnison's Prairie Dog Conservation Strategy, which was a guide for each state within the range to write their own management plan for conservation. Um, also, as part of these ongoing efforts to kind of get a, a handle on their conservation status because of the petition for listing under the ESA, um, they started implementing range-wide mapping efforts for the Gunnison's Prairie Dog in 2007, which happened in at each state in which they occur. Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado are all supposed to be on the same schedule um, about every three years. So last year, it would have taken place in 2000 or 2020. <laughs> I lost track of what year it is. Um, but because of the pandemic, they didn't um, do the statewide map mapping effort last year. Um, it should have been done this year. So I'm, I'll probably hear the results of that sometime this winter, hopefully. Um, but that started and then Arizona Game and Fish started hosting the Gunnison's Prairie Dog Working Group, um, which is a group of interagency um, people and nonprofits that wanted to work together on the conservation of Gunnison's Prairie Dogs. That started in 2006, and I've been a member of that um, since the beginning. So um, through that effort, they wrote together um, the interagency management plan for Gunnison's Prairie Dog in Arizona. So that's kind of the guiding document so far that we have. Um, it identifies a minimum number of 108,000 acres. And this was the result of that first 2007 range-wide mapping effort. So um, just keep in mind that that, you know, compared to the historical numbers, which was 6.6 .6 million acres of Gunnison's Prairie Dogs in Arizona, um, we got down to probably a lot less than 108,000, but this was kind of the, the bare bones um, mapping effort that started, that kind of set the baseline for what um, was considered um, the conservation objectives to try and maintain um, Gunnison's prairie dog populations across 75% of their historic range and try and not dip below 108,000 um, acres, occupied acres of Gunnison's prairie dogs. So their current status that we know, um, just kind of in summary, we know from multiple assessments and documents that um, Gunnison's prairie dogs have declined over 96% across their range, um, especially in just the last century um, that took place. And then they were petitioned for listing. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, did find that they were um, warranted as a candidate species, but only in the montane portion of their range. Um, so kind of this area on the map at the time they listed as a candidate, they didn't include what they considered the prairie um, subspecies of the Gunnison's prairie dog, but then they later reviewed that and removed them as a candidate altogether. Um, so more recent science, there was a PhD student in Colorado who did her research on the genetics of the Gunnison's prairie dog. And she did actually find that there was really strong evidence to um, list two separate subspecies of the Gunnison's prairie dog, the, which she considers um, the montane portion, the Gunnisoni. So that's a subspecies of the Gunnison's prairie dog. But the distinction was probably more along this line. It, it, changed a little bit based on her genetic sampling. Um, it's closer to Colorado and less in New Mexico. And then this prairie subspecies would be considered the, the Zuni subspecies or the Zuniensis um, is what she found through that genetic work that was done in 2013. 
Uh, and then so far right now, the Gunnison's prairie dog is listed as a species of greatest conservation need in all four states, which it occurs, but that doesn't really provide any necessary like legal protection for them. It, it might just provide some resources and funding for the states to do their work to conserve Gunnison's prairie dogs. Uh, so this is a really old map from that very first survey effort, but just to kind of give you a, a overall sense of where they are in Arizona, this is Aubrey Valley, uh, which is the largest occupied area of Gunnison's prairie dogs in the Southwest. Um, and in comparison, you can see this was a map that I created with my husband who um, is a GIS analyst. So we took all the habitat parameters um, and put them into the, a GIS model, looking at things like um, slope and elevation and vegetation and soil type, you know, all the things that would be important uh, for Gunnison's prairie dogs. And you know, found that there's still actually a lot of really good habitat for Gunnison's prairie dogs, but very little of this is occupied uh, to this day. So you can see then we like added in what the actual mapping effort showed and you can see how that kind of lined up uh, with our model with the actual occupied um, model of Aubrey Valley. So that's just a sample of, of what could be <laughs> out there. Um, So I just wanted to touch back on um, plague for those of you that uh, might not know that much about plague um, is actually a non-native introduced disease that came into the US um, by rats on ships that came into the ports of California um, around 1900. And then from that, um, it's actually carried by fleas. So the rats themselves are not carriers of the plague. Um, it's carried by fleas. There's many different species of fleas that can carry the plague bacteria. Um, and it spread um, eastward from the California coast um, throughout the range of all the prairie dog species. Um, so it entered Arizona probably in 1932 and it's been considered endemic to the Western US really ever since. Um, it is a bacteria, like I said, so it can actually be treated by antibiotic, um, but that's only if people realize that they may have contracted uh, the plague bacteria um, early enough to start an antibiotic treatment. Um, prairie dogs have no natural immunity to the plague bacteria. So when the fleas are introduced into a prairie dog colony that have the plague bacteria within their bodies. Um, they'll bite the prairie dogs and then just move basically from prairie dog to prairie dog within those burrow systems. And, and there's basically at least 99% die offs um, in those outbreaks of plagues in colonies. So the prairie dogs themselves are not actually a carrier of the plague. That's a common misconception. Um, they're actually a really good indicator species of plague being present um, in an ecosystem, whereas um, we wouldn't ever necessarily detect um, plague die-offs in other types of squirrels that don't live in colonies the way prairie dogs do. So um, when a prairie dog colony is active, you know that they don't have the plague, um, but if you suddenly see a die-off of a prairie dog colony, then that's a good indication that that plague could be there. So the Coconino County Health Department actually monitors colonies throughout the um, Coconino County. And so they're looking for the presence of plague or die-offs. And if they do detect any fleas that have um, plague in the burrow systems, then they'll start um, dusting with an insecticide to try and reduce the flea loads and save the colonies. Um, so this is something that does happen throughout the range of all the prairie dogs and colonies kind of at this point blink on and off over time. Um, and hopefully if, 
if there are nearby colonies that that were not affected um, that are close enough, then over time in a few years, um, neighboring prairie dogs might start moving back and reestablishing the colonies that died off. Um, but it might not always happen if they're they're far apart from each other. Um, and I just wanted to point out most cases of plague um, that humans get sick or die from um, are usually from having pets that had fleas. Um, so it is really good to make sure if you have outdoor pets that they're being treated with like flea and tick prevention um, or making sure that's something that, that you're monitoring yourself if you um, you know, have outdoor pets that you're in contact with or you're handling or, or you know, skinning dead animals that may have died of plague. Um, so right now, there is, this is an area of active research that's ongoing. Delta dust is the main method we use to try and control fleas in prairie dog colonies. So that's a, a really low grade insecticide that um, the powder um, is squirted into each hole into the burrows for prairie dogs to try and reduce any fleas that are living in the burrows. Um, but it, it is something that has to be done every year um, to be effective and it, um, it could long-term um, potentially build up resistance in the flea colonies to that insecticide because it's a really low, low amount um, that's used. So um, there is active research that's being done on a, a vaccine bait, um, what's called the SPV bait that was developed, I think um, through a veterinary school in Wisconsin. Um, and they did a lot of tests to make sure um, they developed something that the prairie dogs would like to eat. Um, and it's, you know, it's in the form of this like peanut butter flavored bait that has a blue dye to it so that if one a prairie dog eats it they'll uptake that dye that can be detected in their fur or scat so they look like little blueberries um, and Arizona Game and Fish has been working on trying to de develop a drone delivery system um, in colonies in Aubrey Valley and some places where um, they could distribute the baits throughout the colony without having to walk them themselves. Um, but unfortunately there's been a lot of issues with like quality control and some of the, there's like two main manufacturers of this um, SPV bait. And uh, one of them was found to be manufacturing baits that were way lower um, in the necessary dosage. Um, so they weren't actually very effective. And so that affected a lot of the field trials. Um, where prairie dogs were still having plague outbreaks. Um, so there's also now research underway on fipronil, which is uh, basically the same kind of oral um, insecticide that is used in pets, domestic pets, that you can give for like clear ticks. So they're trying to develop a, a fipronil laced grain that could be distributed to prairie dogs that they would eat and then that once they eat that, that would just kill the fleas that bit them. Um, so that there's some potential with that that could be promising. Okay, so going back to, oh, actually we'll just move on to um, the black-footed ferret, um, which I know probably many of you also know or have volunteered um, doing some of the spotlighting. Um, but the black-footed ferret is an endangered species um, that is completely dependent on prairie dogs um, for their survival. So they're considered a prairie dog obligate species. Uh, most of their diet consists of prairie dogs and they also use their burrow systems to live in. Um, and so black-footed ferrets became endangered um, as a result of the widespread eradication efforts for prairie dogs um, throughout the West. Um, the current criteria for recovery of the black-footed ferret includes at least 3,000 um, breeding adults in the wild with 30 or more populations. These are separate and distinct populations um, of black-footed ferrets to be reintroduced in at least nine of the 12 states 
of their historic range. Um, each of those populations should have no fewer than 30 breeding adults. Um, and at least 10 of the populations should have at least 100 breeding adults um, with an objective of at least five populations within the range of the gunnisons of white-tailed prairie dogs. So right now, the last estimate I could find was about 370 black-footed ferrets in the wild. Um, so we're still a long ways away from achieving at least 3,000 breeding adults in the wild. Um, but this just brings me to recently, the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, released a draft EA, which is an environmental assessment for expanding the um, 10J area for black-footed ferret recovery in the Southwest. Um, so what they had done historically was just have a, a very small um, 10J area for black-footed ferret reintroductions in Arizona was only in Aubrey Valley. That was the current plan they were, they were working under. So in this EA, they propose expanding the Southwest experimental population area to include basically all of the potential habitat for prairie dogs in Arizona, um, as well as a small portion in Utah and a small section in New Mexico. But for black-footed ferrets to be reintroduced in areas, they need at least 5,540 acres of occupied Gunnison's prairie dog habitat for at least three years um, to be reintroduced. And then for a population of 30 breeding black-footed ferrets, they would need at least 7,415 acres of occupied Gunnison's prairie dog habitat. Um, and this is within the dispersal range. So it might not be 5,540 um, continuous acres of one colony of prairie dogs. It has to be within basically the dispersal distance of a black-footed ferret. So something that they could easily travel between um, all these occupied acres of Gunnison's prairie dogs to find enough food. Um, to live on. So the US Fish and Wildlife Service just released this EA that identified six priority areas um, in Arizona for potential black-footed ferret reintroduction sites. Um, one is the Abu Valley, which is the only known um, and active reintroduction site for black-footed ferrets in Arizona. Um, and at one point, it was considered a very successful reintroduction site with 123 black-footed ferrets counted in 2012. And then since then, the population has just uh, declined significantly for black-footed ferrets. So there was, I believe, less than 10 black-footed ferrets detected in 2020. Um, and they, they don't really completely understand why. I know there's been a lot of research done and trying to figure out exactly why the black-footed ferret population has um, declined so much at Aubrey Valley. But over the years, there's been an average of 52,000 acres of Gunnison's prairie dog habitat um, in Aubrey Valley. So there's still a lot of prairie dogs available in Aubrey Valley for a robust population of black-footed ferrets. Um, there is plague present in that area, so it's hard to know why um, the black-footed ferrets um, aren't doing so well as of late, um, and hopefully they'll start to rebound. Um, SB Ranch is um, a second site that's on Babbitt Ranches um, north, and so that's considered the second most like viable habitat for um, black-footed ferret reintroduction. There's at least um, 3,000 occupied acres of Gunnison's prairie dogs there. Um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Arizona Game and Fish did attempt to do a number of releases of black-footed ferrets on the SB Ranch, and unfortunately, they were never detected um, again. So they, they think that plague um, caused the decline of, of prairie dogs, and that in turn affected the black-footed ferrets. 
Um, so those are the two biggest sites. And then they identified um, four other sites that are much smaller. So just to give you a sense of um, these other sites are on the Kaibab. I do not know if this um, nearly 5,000 acres, which is you know getting up to the, the um, needed acreage for black-footed parrot reintroduction, but I do not know that this is all within that dispersal um, range for black-footed parrots. So this could be spread out in numerous different locations on the Kaibab National Forest. Um, the CO Bar Ranch only has 870 acres, so that's a long ways away. Um, Petrified Forest only has 408 acres of Gunnison's Prairie Dogs um, as of 2020. So that's really small. Um, and then Lyman Lake is considered the sixth priority area. Um, so this is to say it's both, I would say both good and bad um, when I look at this information, because I think it's good that um, Arizona Game and Fish and US Fish and Wildlife Service has identified some real priority areas to try and focus increasing the Gunnison's Prairie Dog colonies in those areas um, with a, a clear goal to use them for future black-footed ferret reintroduction sites. But um, it's also kind of a bad thing because when I think of Petrified Forest National Park, um, 408 acres, that seems like that could take the rest of my life <laughs> to ever get to 5,540 acres in Petrified Forest. Um, I hope that's not the case, but um, so what can we do to help um, prairie dogs in Arizona? Um, we can definitely support translocation efforts. I think the, the science over the last 10 to 15 years has really improved our translocation methods. Um, they can be successful and they're a great alternative over just eradicating or developing over prairie dog colonies especially now that we, we do have these um, priority sites that we need to really help assist and, and grow those colonies in those areas. Um, we can continue to monitor um, poisoning efforts that are done by pest control companies, wildlife services. Um, US Fish and Wildlife Service says that this is a really small threat these days, but um, you know, that the acres that have been poisoned have been small and not actually concentrated in those areas where they've identified as those six priority sites for prairie dog colonies, but it's still happening. Um, and we know that wildlife services is still getting contracts uh, by ranchers and, and even a large wind farm um, out near um, Snowflake has had a contract with wildlife services for years to poison the prairie dogs um, under the wind meals. So that's still an ongoing issue that, that we should uh, just eliminate because that's not necessary. Um, we can speak up for stricter hunting regulations at Arizona Game and Fish. We can increase the, the length of the closed season as well as I think it's really important to try and advocate for bag limit on prairie dogs to try and stop target shooting. This is one of the, you know, it's really one of the only species of wildlife that live in this colonial um, nature that people can go out and from, you know, hundreds of yards away, set up their scopes and, and high powered rifles, and then just shoot literally like hundreds of prairie dogs in a few hours um, with very little um, regulations. Um, it's just basically a, a general hunting tag is all they need. So, you know, somebody could do that for like $40 and shoot as many prairie dogs as they want um, versus, you know, all the work and effort that goes into um, actually trying to save prairie dogs. Um, again, like I just mentioned, we do know that there have been renewable energy developments in the state that are actively poisoning and trying to get rid of prairie dogs. Not so much because the prairie dogs are doing anything um, or causing any issues under windmills, but 
because that puts that company at risk for um, Eagle or Hawk take um, under the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So they ha would have to pay really expensive fines or permits um, for the impact those uh, renewable energy developments will have on raptors that are coming in to feed on the prairie dogs themselves. So that's why they're actively trying to kill them. So that's something that's important um, to continue to watch um, as those plans are being developed. Um, there is also a, a lot of research done on non-lethal coexistence options. Um, this was something that we worked on just a few years ago um, through Habitat Harmony. Um, we published a non-lethal management guide for Gunnison's Prairie Dog that has a lot of options that look at like barriers and fencing and things like that. And even um, a method called reverse dispersal translocation that, that walks people through step-by-step step so people can try and um, move prairie dogs out of areas they don't want them on their property and then put in a barrier to keep them from moving back in. And that's something that people can do on their own without actually handling the prairie dogs themselves. Um, and that's free also that you can download that as a PDF on our uh, website. And we also have printed copies of those handbooks for free. And then lastly, I just threw in um, trying to support local plans and ordinances to protect um, not only prairie dogs, but uh, all wildlife within cities. This is something that Habitat Harmony has been working on the last few years in Flagstaff. Um, we presented a draft ordinance um, for the city of Flagstaff that would require developers um, either translocate prairie dogs before the development goes in or potentially take some other mitigation efforts. So we're working on that right now with the city staff um, and expect that to go before city council for approval sometime soon, like in, in the next six months, I would guess. Hopefully we'll get that. Um, ordinance um, considered. And then that would be the first of its kind in Arizona, but it could definitely apply to other places like Williams, um, Springerville, um, Snowflake, other places um, that are also um, develop, developing over prairie dog colonies. So with that, I'll finish there. And if you guys have any questions, hopefully I didn't take too much of the meeting <laughs> for you. Yeah, I, I do, and, Emily, that was so great. I had no idea. I had the opportunity to get to teach this summer about rattlesnakes, and I thought they were the, the plague of, the, of exist, people's existence, but to learn about prairie dogs as a beneficial species, and I'm assuming the black-footed ferrets also eat bunnies and mice and every other little critter, but when the prairie dogs are gone, that impacts them that much, huh? Yeah, their diet is 90% prairie dogs. It is, wow, they have a huge preference. Yeah. So I Googled the difference between gophers and prairie dogs when you first started talking, and I came up with this pest control company that was really putting down prairie dogs because they carry the plague, but they didn't say anything about the gophers that I hate. You know, it was the prairie dogs that were evil in their little ad that popped up on my on my Google. Yeah, the poor little prairie dogs. Yeah, a lot so of people I, also miss uh, like miss uh, interpret pocket mm -hmm. gopher tunnels yeah. and burrows as prairie dogs. Um, so that's something that's kind of common. But I'm not really a pocket gopher expert, um, oh. so I can't <laughs> I can't suggest non lethal. Uh, suggestions for living with pocket gophers. There's a lot of anecdotal recommendations yeah. out there, but um, one thing I know, I, Khan Sabashkov always like to talk about how like the pocket gophers and the prairie dogs really work together to maintain prairie ecosystems. So they both have a really important role. In but they're horrible in a garden. I just had to quit gardening. You know, I tried everything non-lethal and I just had to quit gardening. I just quit. Let them let them win. But there is there, I worked um, all, I, I worked oh. all summer in Flag, and there's a colony right outside the Coconino Forest Service office on 89, right by the highway. 
And I didn't know it because I drove by there every day until I walked that little entryway one day and they were up chattering at me. And I went, oh my gosh, those are prairie dogs because gophers do not do that. You never see them. But the prairie dogs are very fun. Yeah, they definitely get to know you. I think the more mm -hmm. you're around a colony, if you have one on your property, they definitely recognize. They do. Great. Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Just unmute yourself. Thanks. Hi, Emily. Um, I have a few questions. Um, so just curious about, you know, the translocation that happened over at Continental and those, I believe, went out to um, the Babbitt Ranch. Um, and is so is that the same area that they're putting in the wind farm things? And I, I'm sure that's a hard choice to make between raptors and prairie dogs. That's that, but do you know what there's are they how the first of all, how the how are they doing? Have you seen the, them out there and what's going on with that? And then what mm -hmm. is their stance on the wind farm and all that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the um prairie dogs that I translocated from like my master's really in 2007 through like just like the last five years um, we switched to taking prairie dogs out to Petrified Forest National Park so the last three translocations I've done I've moved them just to Petrified Forest because that's a much more protected area mm -hmm. um, but the at least the prairie dogs from my master's work, um, those colonies still exist, um, mm -hmm. which is on the CO bar that's um, north of Flagstaff on Babbitt Ranches, just to the west of Wapaki in that area. Um, and those were colonies that had been eradicated um, by plague. Uh, they weren't reestablishing themselves. So we released those into abandoned burrow systems. Um, and they've They've existed, which is kind of amazing because um, human hunters did find those colonies really quickly um, after I released um, those prairie dogs. That was that was really interesting to watch. I didn't see, um, you know, I was out there every day um, trying to monitor their survival and recapture prairie dogs um, over time. And I I would see predators occasionally, but I never saw any active predation events actually occur, but I did witness human hunting. Um, so that was the main source of mortality that I could document through my research. Um, but they're still out there. They've kind of moved around um, and kind of um, spread around it in slightly different areas um, than the actual like release holes that they were first released into. Um, and then the Babbitts are involved in the major, both wind and solar installation, but that's gonna be west of Highway 64. So I think west of like Vail Valley um, area. Um, I don't think it's right in that SB ranch area where the main prairie dogs are, but um, Coconino County has been developing a renewable energy ordinance to try and address um, the permits for the Babbitt Ranch renewable energy projects. Um, and one of the things that they did agree to was um, at least under, I know the solar, I think it's gonna be about 10 acres of solar panels. Um, they are going to allow small um, mammals, small animals under those solar panels. Um, so that was a pretty important when I think in the language of the ordinance for that. Um, and in turn, the Babbitt Ranches is trying to develop a, a Golden Eagle conservation area on the CO bar. So in a separate area from the wind turbines, they're gonna try and do more active Golden Eagle um, conservation. And that's probably as an offset um, to the wind farm installation. So I'm sorry, I just have one more question. So the ordinance that's gonna go before the city and and you're not sure like six months maybe, but first of its kind, that's awesome. Um, so as a, a 
a citizen here in, <laughs> in Flagstaff. Um, what just writing a letter to the editor, writing to the city council, what would you suggest as far as um, some input they need to hear? Yeah, so we're, um, oops, sorry. we're working on uh, refining that language with the city um, planning manager right now, or the code manager, sorry. Um, so we're working on like getting the language all kind of like squared away for what will be in that final ordinance right now. And then um, it, it was already, um, so we presented like four or five years ago, we presented four natural resource protection ordinances for city council um, to approve. One was wildlife corridors, uh, one was seeps and springs protection, another was prairie dogs, um, and then the last one was, I'm gonna blank on it off the top of my head right now. Um, they were all things that were identified in the Flagstaff Regional Plan. So that was kind of our first step, was trying to make sure that we had certain, um, you know, habitat considerations and wildlife species um, identified as important in our Flagstaff Regional Plan. And then once we did that, we kind of have the leverage to say, well, now we need to get the city code up to match what actually was written in the regional plan. So that's what we're working on now is trying to get these through um, to match that. And um, the Prairie Dogs will be the first ordinance of those four to probably go before council. But it was approved actually unanimously um, when we first presented the drafts uh, to city council. It was um, approved unanimously to go to city staff to work on those ordinances. Um, and now the Prairie Dogs is, will be the first one uh, to go forward. So I can definitely let uh, you know, I can let other people know that are interested like when that will come up on this um, city council calendar. And because we'll definitely want people to, to make sure that we're speaking out to support that ordinance and um, probably getting more public awareness about approving it as well. But I think the city council is actually uh, more favorable now than it even was uh, when it first went before council a few years ago. So hopefully that won't be a big issue, but um, developers can definitely, uh, when they you know learn more about it, they'll probably start weighing in um, to oppose it. Um, and so this is actually something that will be the first of its kind in Arizona, but the city of Santa Fe has an ordinance that requires translocations in Santa Fe. Um, and the city of Boulder in Colorado also has a lot of um, good protections for prairie dogs that we used as models to try and help us write our ordinance. And thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, and if you want, you can post the info to this um, Google group, or if you send it to me, I can post it to let everybody know. Uh, Karen. This is a this is just a quick question because I know we're uh, we have time constraints. But Emily, you did a fantastic job on the presentation, absolutely phenomenal. Um, and and we you know without getting into the ranching influence on the Game and Fish Commission, which we understand you know informs their their feelings about prairie dogs or their you know, strategy with prairie dogs, but but how can they justify the continued um, slaughter of of prairie dogs in Aubrey Valley? The you know, target shooting with no mm -hmm. limit when they are trying to reintroduce the black-footed ferret in that same region? Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> it's a good question. I mean, basically, they're just like, well, you know, at least in the, that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service environmental assessment, when they looked at the threat of shooting, um, they didn't really address it that much, you know, but by saying other than it's like, doesn't seem to be that big of an impact um, or threat. And if it's necessary, they could uh, issue temporary hunting closures in certain priority areas that they identified, um, but they don't really do that ever. You know, they don't, they don't want to go out of their way to impose more hunting restrictions on anybody um, mm -hmm. 
but they like easy targets too. They like easy targets. Yeah. So it's definitely something that I think um, I, you know, I wrote a letter to the commissioners back in 2009, asking them to extend the close season. And I think it really took uh, the Arizona Game and Fish staff um, pushing for it to finally get that through. I think that was changed in maybe 2012. So it, it did come from some internal pressure, not so much outside um, conservation groups pushing for it. So that's definitely one approach to, I think, working with the staff on the Black-Footed Ferret team or Holly Hicks at Game and Fish who works on prairie dogs, trying to see like, what, what do we need to do to change these hunting regulations? And can it come from her? How can we support her um, in trying to push for those changes internally? Um, but yeah, it's, it's ongoing for sure across the range. And I don't think, you know, what we know about the impact of, of shooting is from voluntary um, hunter surveys, you know? So I don't know what the latest statistics are on that, if they've done more recent voluntary hunter surveys, but I mean, it's like hundreds of thousands of prairie dogs that are shot. And that's just what they're voluntarily reporting. So I'm sure it's probably a much greater impact than was actually being um, assessed. Well, thank you, Emily. That was a great presentation and great questions as well. Uh, we appreciate you sharing all that information and the status of both prairie dogs and uh, black-footed ferrets. Uh, so we got a little twofer, a little info on one of the um, key predators and yep, there, there's Dale. <laughs> uh, actually, I should stop recording here. Um.